the stuff. Okay, the other uh, method that we're using um, in this uh, uh, is uh, uh, grounded theory. And grounded theory really can be, I think, most accurately explained as a research method in which the theory is developed from the data rather than the other way around. And this is frequently used in, uh, in cross-cultural research. Um, so of course, this is an inductive approach and in that it moves from the specific to the more general based on what's being experienced in the research process, of course. And um, uh, the method is, is based on three elements, uh, concepts, categories, and propositions. And these together are essentially the same thing as a hypothesis. But these concepts are the key uh, elements of analysis because the theories developed from the conceptualization of the data rather than the actual data, of course, at the first step. And so the primary objective of grounded theory is to expand on an explanation of the phenomenon uh, by identifying the key elements of that phenomenon and then categorizing the relationships of those elements to the context and the process of what we're doing. And so the goal is to go from the general to the specific without losing sight of who makes uh, I mean, sorry, of what makes the subject uh, of a study uh, unique. And so in that sense, then, um, it's also a method. Uh, grounded theory um, is a method in a sense that separates theory and data and tries to understand relationships in terms of the culture of the people uh, who uh, are, are sharing the knowledge. Thank you. Yoko. Yoko, we can't hear you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, somebody, uh, the janitor was doing a cleaning outside. Oh yeah. So this is the map right bottom shows the corroborated communities in Siberia and Alaska. And this table shows the example, one inland, one coastal. And those community sites and exemplified population sizes and the geographic locations in two continent. Our Siberian collaborator communities are larger than Alaska communities in general. And Chokoda's coastal area, their local main economy is commercial fishing and the fishermen maintain their ice cellars for storing fish for sale. Alaskan residents compared to Siberia, they work on wage labor while some people practice subsistence hunting and fishing. Sabunga residents' main diet include various marine mammals, including seal, walrus, whale, migratory bird, and plants. People in Anaktubuk Pass focus on caribou hunting. In a visit in, uh, to Anaktubuk Pass last summer, we observed that the community received the whale fat from the neighboring community Nuxit that exemplifies the traditional diet and trading continue today. And those are the language, they have a local indigenous language, Sakha or Siberian Yupik, in Yupiak in Alaska. But in the 21st century, majority of the population use Russian and English. From a field trip in 2021, we conducted household surveys in those communities and learned that ownership of ice cellars varies, including family, community, or clan owned. How do you access to local knowledge? We discovered that researchers can use CBPR that are regionally relevant. Here are some themes of how we begin to collaborate with the study communities and have access to local knowledge in Siberia and Alaska. In Siberia, we initially contacted individual Russian researchers who are project team members already established rapport through other projects. After we learned their interest in the project, our team members and the collaborating Russian researchers visited study communities to conduct field work. We used the snowball method through researchers and local family networks to identify and conduct the household surveys and interviews. And this coming year, we are hoping to uh, the hire local community research assistant for the project. In Alaska, 
we initially contacted the local government, including federal recognized local village councils, cities, and boroughs. After having a community meeting and local government collaboration support, tribal councils identified their community assistant for the project. In a second trip to the community, we will request the councils to identify local knowledge holders, elders for the oral history project interviews. Researchers and we will establish rapport with collaborating communities through participating community events, listening to elders' stories, visiting community members, and perhaps lots of coffee visits coming uh, this coming year. So this is a one, uh, slide from uh, one of our colleagues. Our project consists of interdisciplinary researchers, including ecologists, physical climatologists, geochronologists, in addition to anthropologists. This slide shows case studies of how we conduct the geochronological investigation at selected communities. From our previous visit, we learned that many Arctic communities, they were interested in the fate of permafrost in their land and the consequences of the permafrost fall. At their request, we will install measurement devices in ice cellars and the surrounding permafrost to monitor physical conditions, such as temperature, humidity, and air circulation. We will also collect and analyze permafrost samples to understand frozen ground stability and future impact upon permafrost fall. On the right is the map of a special distribution of ground displacement around an October pass. And we present that and we shared our funding when we went there in this last summer. This kind of displacement is often associated with permafrost fall. Together with monitoring activities of physical conditions, we will utilize remote sensing tools to understand geospatial information of the community's environment, including permafrost conditions. And we continue to share our findings with the communities to learn more from local perspectives. And in next slide, we will introduce current ICERA conditions in our collaborative communities. And let's go with a movie. Hope it will show up. <laughs> Где-то где конец 60-х, начало 70-х годов построен. Здесь мы, ну, Булус находится в очень хорошем состоянии. Здесь, видите, нету. А как? And he's uh, from Alaska, and this is September. We're going to Mike. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Yoko. So, um, as you can see by the uh, video and by the pictures, including the one on this one uh, on this uh, slide as well, uh, we're we're focused on particularly the food life history of uh, the food that's uh, stored in underground. Uh, 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 meat caches, uh, generally speaking. And of course, these differ from place to place and culture to culture. And so what we're trying to understand is the process uh, of, uh, 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 of obtaining the food, processing the food, preserving the food, uh, and consuming the food, and the, uh, the cultural values that go along with this. But of course, we're doing this uh, as an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary project. And so we're trying to understand it in terms as, uh, of the climate change that's affecting these areas as well, and the limitations uh, on making use of these sorts of storage facilities. 
um, which of course uh, uh, changes uh, everything, uh, including especially the taste of the meat uh, uh, or walrus in this case specifically, as we see in this one. Um, and um, uh, it, it also prevents the fermentation process uh, from being carried uh, on the way that it would uh, that, that they would like to. Uh, what we saw is in the 19 with the 1960s and 70s and the coming of electricity too. Uh, uh, how much easier it was for people to store uh, meat in electric freezers, but of course it's also more costly and you can't get the same sort of taste. So the food life history then is uh, a process of understanding all the sociocultural aspects of the food and its connection, of course, to the, eco uh, to the ecology of the region. And so uh, uh, here in Alaska, then, uh, what we're focusing on uh, are the uh, communities of Point Hope, Anaktuvik Pass, Savunga, and Gamble uh, to give us uh, uh, a wide uh, uh, geographical uh, set of variations between communities for comparisons, because uh, what we've learned is that communities are very interested in understanding how other communities uh, are uh, dealing with the climate change that's affecting underground uh, uh, storage caches um, and the quality uh, of the foods that are stored uh, uh, stored within. And so we hope to develop uh, develop food security plans and strategies with each of the communities uh, to help uh, us to understand and to help them to uh, uh, practically deal with uh, these changes that are occurring. And there are still some of these uh, in use, I should point out, um, uh, uh, particularly uh, on St. Lawrence Island. Um, and we found uh, that people were interested in the revitalization of these, if there's a way that can be found uh, to be appropriate uh, under the current conditions of climate change. Thanks. And finally, in the future, what we hope to do um, is to uh, expand this to other communities, both within Alaska and Siberia, and possibly uh, even in Hokkaido, and, um, uh, uh, and then to identify uh, in the communities that are interested uh, potential uh, poss uh, possibilities for excavation and archaeological excavation uh, to better understand how these uh, structures are built and how they function, what their capacities are. And, um, uh, we hope to do uh, further ethnographic and ecological comparisons with communities, uh, not only in, uh, between communities in different parts of Alaska, but of course with communities um, in Chukotka and Saha as well, uh, to, uh, to uh, help to create cooperative strategies in this research and to better understand uh, the process of food life history, to better understand too how food security and food sovereignty can be achieved and maintained uh, in the communities according uh, to the local values. Thank you. Thank you. And that's our last slide, yes. by the way. Thanks. Uh, last slide. I think we have maybe two minutes for questions. Yes. <laughs> You, if if you have any questions, I can stop sharing so that people can see. Thanks. Thank you. If any, if any more, any comments? <laughs> Thank you. Well, maybe we can also keep up the clock. <laughs> We start two minutes late, so I think we are good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are looking forward to, to the second year field trip this summer. Um, we're planning yeah. to go to Point Hope. Right, and I should also point out that it was uh, the Research Institute for Humanity and Nature in Kyoto that funded the first portion of this research and, uh, and helped us to uh, understand uh, what interest there might be in, in, in Alaska uh, to, to uh, partner. And so NSF then is providing, uh, in a sense, the other half of the, of the funding for the overall project, for the international uh, project. And uh, they've been very generous in, in supporting our interdisciplinary approach to this. So we're very grateful to both of those institutions. I also see that Dr. Saito Katsuyuki. Uh, I know the Japanese uh, call us, uh, they were probably very early in the morning. <laughs> yes. Glad to see we are here. Thank you. 
Yes, I think it's very early in the morning in Kyoto right now. <laughs> so thanks for joining us, those of you who did join from Japan. Well, I think we're supposed to pass it on now. I think there's a there's a there's a host here maybe, and just like to let you know that we're passing it on to the next presentation. Thanks. Yes, thank you so much. So I'm gonna uh, introduce the next presenter. And if you're ready to share your screen, please go ahead. Next presenter there, um, Anne, Larry, and Caroline Frank, who tended the garden. And I think you're ready. If you're ready to go, please go ahead. Start. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yoko. And uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I think it's a nice segue into the work that Caroline and I have been developing when we're talking about interdisciplinary work um, and CBPR models for research. Uh, so my name is Anne Lally. I am a researcher in the Department of Community Health and Health Behavior, and also a research associate in the Department of Anthropology at the University at Buffalo. And I am co-presenting today with my colleague, Caroline Funk. She is an archeologist and research assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University at Buffalo. And she has extensive experience working in the Aleutians. Uh, my work personally focuses on agriculture, food, multi-species studies, um, and just really understanding the interconnections in the food system. I wrote my dissertation on agricultural practice in animals in Iceland, and I work with the Seneca Nation in the Southern tier of New York currently on food access programming and partnership development. So Caroline and I, Caroline and I came to work on this project together because our shared interests in the relationships between plants and people, as well as how archeological, archival, and ethnographic knowledge around plant management and food culture can be traced through time and connected to the present. Um, so our, our presentation is entitled Who Tended the Gardens? Tracing Unanga Foodways Through the Historical Record and Beyond. And really just a note on where we are in our research process, our process. We're just really getting started and um, developing some of our frameworks for the work that we would like to do and have been really uh, hitting the archival resources currently. So that's really where the focus is along with some of Caroline's archeological work in our presentation. So just to begin, I wanted to touch on a little bit of theory that kind of guides our thinking uh, through these worlds. Uh, the idea of culinary identity making and the agency of eating, um, really thinking about the micro and macro dimensions of food, right? So the micro being what food does in the human body, the matter of its substance, the nutritive benefits of food and how we take those building blocks of what we consume and create our own bodies. Uh, the macro being how social and political dynamics potentially constrain what foods go into our bodies, the meanings we give to particular foods and the value we bestow on certain knowledges and their sources. And this is pulled from Emma Jane Abbott's work entitled The Agency of Eating. So the micro and macro really function on the individual body, the collective body, the social body in this sense. And this is where we are seeking to you know, trace these histories of food production and consumption throughout time. I wanted to touch on colonization and foodways and the impacts of colonization on foodways. So colonization impacts foodways in that it obscures and replaces goods, uh, sundries and supplies from outsiders, as well as seeds and agricultural animals brought in from outsiders can replace items within the extant food system of these uh, cultures that have been colonized. This idea of syncretism or evolution, selective adoption, again, the integration of foreign foods and tastes into extant local food culture and practices that create new, new versions of food culture, right? The dynamism of how food is flexible and how foodways become integrative of outside elements and kind of recombine and reimagine these elements. And ultimately, um, colonization impacts the value of food as an enduring and personal cultural marker. So losing this continuity in food production and consumption um, impacts the processes of the individual, of the group in identity formation. 
And just a note on food sovereignty and ideas of food sovereignty, I really liked Kyle Powis White's description and extension of food sovereignty. So food sovereignty should be seen at least in part as a strategic process of indigenous resurgence that negotiates structures of settler colonialism that erase the ecological values of certain foods for indigenous people. So really extending the idea of food sovereignty outside of self-sufficiency and looking at these smaller pieces of the puzzle and how um, the ecological values of certain foods can be reclaimed and revitalized through food sovereignty practices. And I think with anything uh, in terms of speaking of food sovereignty, it's not my role or researchers' roles to decide what a, a process of food sovereignty will look like. Um, and I think it's important to embrace kind of the multi-dimensions of food sovereignty. So how was food being produced in the Aleutians prior to and during colonization? Uh, you can see here in these images of Unalaska and Unga Island that there's very distinct um, agricultural plots, garden plots, typically used for farming potatoes. Um, in these images, uh, uh, the top two being at Unalaska, the bottom being at Unga. So colonizers begin influencing ideas of what is and is not food. Certain plants become obscured from this narrative by imported items. We constantly see reference to potatoes and potato gardens. Um, the colonizers also control the narrative of whose labor is important, which I think is an, really an important way of looking at the archival work that we've been looking through. So economic interest was the fur trade. So emphasis was then placed on maritime hunting and fishing in these records. Um, food plants were kind of seen as merely subsistence, not necessarily a major part of the narrative. So we looked to Netsvatov's accounts of gardening at Atka to inform our work. The way that we look at these accounts is that they at least provide a framework for understanding the seasonal reverberations um, at ATCA. So garden beds at ATCA were prepared in April to May. Provisioning by students at the ATCA school was completed at the end of September to the beginning of October. And the process repeats itself throughout the seasons and throughout the years. Um, in his accounts, Netsvatov talks about Sarana, satchels of roots, berries, and then potatoes. Uh, the question that we have from these accounts is, are these items in Net Netsvatov's accounts only those being provisioned by the Russian settlement? Are there other um, plants being grown in or near or in conjunction with these gardens? And then also this idea of laborers in the gardens. Are they only students of the Atka school? Who maintains the gardens between planting and harvesting? And just as an interesting note, throughout his accounts, Netsvatov becomes more engaged in gardening practice over time. So you can see in the uh, 1840s, then he starts talking about how he was living at the vegetable garden place, harvesting potatoes, that he didn't hold services because he was at the gardening place. So we get to get a little bit more texture about those accounts as time goes by. So ecological knowledge and gardening in the Russian period, I mean, as this greater idea of ecological knowledge versus just this agricultural knowledge or gardening knowledge, how can we be so certain that the Russians brought all agricultural technology with them to the Aleutians as has been um, indicated in previous literature? Uh, because they deferred largely to the Inanga for all other forms of ecological knowledge. Uh, so you can see here um, in, in Black's quote from 1984, the Russians as a rule respected the native knowledge of local conditions. And this really extended from hunting techniques to modes of navigation to architecture. Uh, why, would this, why would that kind of reliance on the Unanga ecological knowledge end there? Um, the next quote is from a Russian naval captain. Uh, quoted in Beltry, 1980. So if the company should somehow lose the Aleuts, then it will be completely forfeit the hunting of sea animals because not one Russian knows how to hunt the animals and none of our settlers has learned how in all the time that the company has had its possessions here. So again, this reliance on the knowledge of the Unanga. And finally, Veltri says that Korvinsky also had gardens for potatoes and other vegetables as pictured here. Um, so it is reasonable to suppose that the gardens were fairly extensive and the Russian American company had hired Aleuts to work in its gardens at Sitka and it may be assumed that this took place at 
the Korovinsky said as well at ADCA. So again, what agricultural knowledge was brought by the, these laborers? Who were these laborers? What was the gender of these laborers? Um, these are all important questions that are kind of lost from this archival documentation and can't necessarily be reconstructed in the archaeology. And I think, again, just understanding the gaps in these accounts, we see this lack of uh, gardening or plant management knowledge, and also this lack of the female voice and the female role within the majority of these accounts. So the idea of hidden gardens is an interesting one because Veltri describes how hidden gardens could account for the lack of what we understand as gardens represented in, for example, Lewis's, Lewis Chorus's 1816 painting of the Unalaska settlement, along with other contemporaneous accounts. So this idea that you couldn't necessarily see the gardens uh, up front in viewing the landscape. So garden plots at Unalaska is quoted in by uh, Kitlitz in Beltry 2011, the few houses of the Russian settlement at Unalaska were at the edge of the grassy meadow and did not in the least disturb the landscape. The buildings surrounded by potato fields, which could hardly be seen because of the prolific growth of the wild vegetation, my emphasis, were far apart from each other. So in looking at Kitlitz's drawing of this house in Unalaska, it's interesting to me because we do see this netted garden space in the bottom right, and then we see what is described as wild vegetation to the left, this large plot. So I zoomed in on this and I was kind of pouring over it, trying to get my ideas together for this presentation. And I was like, let me just kind of take eyeball these plants a little bit. And this is really just not very scientific in my process. But again, it's hard to debate the, that these plants have a specific analog in reality, right? So this, this, these large spires look like this monk's hood, um, which Caroline will speak about in her archeological piece, um, monk's hood as a medicinal plant more than a food plant. And then again, we see these, uh, these bracts here and it could be an angelica, it could be parsley, but then you see these leaves in the foreground. And again, this is really looking like cow parsnip or poochki um, within this space. So I want to turn it over now to Caroline to speak a little bit more about her findings uh, related to these plants. Hello. So uh, Anne N has had a look at the ethnohistoric and the um, the visual record from the ethnic historic era. And uh, with some work I did with Debbie Corbett and a few other colleagues a few years ago, we're, we're gonna go a little deeper into the past to partner uh, the more modern and the deeper past analysis of plants and people and food ways. So a few years ago, um, some colleagues and I asked ourselves how we can learn um, about how, when, and to what extent ancestral Anangan manage their plant resources. And we started by asking a baseline question. Are there many plants that could be useful as food, medicine, raw materials present in the Aleutian Island landscapes? And this is not an unreasonable question to ask. The acidic Aleutian soils formed within the last 10,000 years. They're regularly subjected to volcanic eruptions, gases, ashes, mud flows, and lavas. Um, they're subjected to maritime climate conditions with wild storms, high winds, continuous saltwater exposure, and uh, the plant regimes are subject to episodic changes in climate regimes. And as it turns out, there's only a small number of ecoregion types and a limited number of specialized habitats in the Aleutians. So the plant communities are considered depauperate. There's only 522 species of vascular plants there. Uh, in comparison, North America has 21,000 species. Globally, there's about 369 species of plants defined changes daily. But what's interesting is that 482 of those 522 species, and that's 92%, have medicinal, raw material, or food use in the wider world. Useful plants are present, and they are present in abundance. Next slide, Anne. And most of you know, many of you know, we visually identify uh, the coastal archeological village sites in the Aleutians by their distinctively lush vegetation, same uh, lush vegetation Anne was just talking about. And in 1973, 
uh, Martinson in a geography thesis comments pretty casually that during the Russian period, the black soils of the slopes of the villages were probably used as gardens since black soil seems to produce much better than the common red soils. It doesn't seem a far stretch to consider that Inangaman ancestors made this same observation and the same decisions to garden in these places. And if they were like people in other Northern areas of the world, they may have deliberately developed the black soils as a productive resource. We know from the Komisardi soil chemistry work that uh, the deposition of marine resources like shellfish, fish, marine mammals in these middens resulted in nitrogen enriched soil conditions. This altered plant community composition, plant size, plant lushness. And we ask, um, did these changes result from deliberative action or are these unintended consequences? As we contemplate this question, it's worth noting that 100% of the 104 plants identified on village sites are useful to humans as food, material, and medicine. Only a couple of them remain unmentioned in current published Inamgan plant lore. Next slide, Anne. To think about the many ways ancestral Inanga may have used plants, I turn to MCAT Anderson's work in California. She studied um, native plant use there and uh, it's a really fine grained analysis if you're not familiar with it. To, and I, I tried to understand what could be made of plant products, not including food and medicine. And what I learned was that most of the things that you need to get by in a complex human life included plant source components. This means it's crucial for us to grasp and model the sheer volume of plant materials needed to make things. And we've, we've woefully underestimated the labor costs involved in harvesting, caring, storing, and crafting because plants and possibly women's labor have been invisible in archeological inquiry and in the ethnohistoric record. This means we've also underestimated the potential for landscape and plant community transformation in the Aleutians. It takes hundreds of bundles of carefully managed, seasonally harvested and cured materials to make baskets and sleeping mats, to make cordage necessary for fishing, for fishing lines and fishing nets. Thousands of bundles of sedges and grasses, bundles of straight sticks, coils of rhizomes. These represent significant expert level labor investment. Next slide, Anne. And as Anne tracked us through the ethnohistoric sketches and diary entries, um, we see that the ethno-historical documents give us what we suspect is only a subset of information about Inanga plant use. Plants and women with their expert knowledge and their labor rarely appear. We have many descriptions of kayaks, sea mammal hunting, fishing and the sea, but where are the plants? Where are the women in their work? And where are the gardens? And who were the gardeners before Russians arrived? Villages are multi-generational and owned spaces occupied episodically possibly continually for thousands of years, presumably by consistent families. The plants and other resources in the area were known to the people who lived there, and as we hypothesize, tended by the people who lived there. And I think when we say people, Anne and I might mean specifically women. Anne, back to you. Thank you, Caroline. So just to bring it back to the contemporary time period from the archeological record and the archival documents. Um, I just wanted to pull some contemporary Unangam recipes using Puchki. So these recipes are documented in uh, Susan Unger's, or I'm sorry, Sue Ann Unger's uh, compendium of Unanga recipes. And there are recipes like baked salmon wrapped in Puchki, um, pickled puchki and numerous other recipes that use puchki as a seasoning or supplement. I've, I've borrowed this image of pickled puchki uh, from Unger's work. And I think it's just very interesting that Caroline is finding these indications of puchki in these settlement areas, that we see it in the imagery of the archival, the historical documents. And now also it is, remains an important plant food and identity marker within contemporary culture. So what we're really looking to do as we move forward is continue tracing these plants through the historic record, through the archeological record into present day. And what we're thinking about going forward with this project is 
this is just preliminary work. We're forming a groundwork for our future research. Uh, I'm, I'm going to Alaska for archival work in the spring summer. And I'd love to have the opportunity to network with individuals who are working in this space already. Um, we really want to develop a deeper understanding of colonial and post-colonial food traditions through archival research and interviews. Um, and we're hoping to meet with people who are, again, working in this space already. Um, our purpose is to share this research process. And I think uh, Michael speaking about CBPR really speaks to us and our goals with the design of this project. Uh, we want to share the research project we, process. We want to learn together through community partnerships and have community members really drive what we're looking into, how we're looking into it, and how we're sharing it and using it going forward. And uh, really be able to link the past to the present with, through our research on the ground and possibly develop an ancestral garden or other uh, contemporary projects based on archaeological evidence married to contemporary foodways in the Aleutians. Uh, thank you all so much. And again, our contact is here. We'd love to hear um, from anyone who's interested in this work. And hopefully, if you are working in this space, you will be hearing from me in the coming months as I prepare to come north. So thank you so much. And uh, based on the convention that we've uh, standardized, I will now introduce our next presentation. Let me stop sharing. Thank you uh, nice. so much, Anne. Oh, thank you. Yes, yes, we thank you so much. Yeah, since we have a, a 20 minutes past, so we're gonna move on to the next presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, next person is uh, Nina Schultz. The talk is about conceptualizing indigenous knowledge among the Yupik. And if you're ready to share screen, please go ahead and start. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, thank you so much. Um, I, I actually will not be uh, sharing the screen um, today, um, but this is more of a, a discursive um, uh, situation. Um, uh, my, my main work, so to speak, uh, my day job is with the uh, ATLA, Collectors and Connectors in Religion and Theology, um, uh, an organization based in the Chicago area, um, which um, indexes, I'm I'm one of a team of metadata analysts and editors um, who index various uh, material uh, on religion and um, contribute to, to a database. And what, what, I, what I do for this conference, so to speak, is stems very much from my, um, uh, my graduate work in anthropology, which was, um, which I continue, um, on, on a very limited basis, unfortunately. Um, and more recently, I've turned my attention to, yes, indeed, the, the vast importance of indigenous knowledge. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the religious life among the uh, Yupik people of the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta region. And that is uh, what I'll be speaking about today. Um, an effective way to think about indigenous knowledge is to analyze its multifaceted quality, both as a storehouse of cultural knowledge, the knowledge of languages, ethical codes, belief systems, artworks, rituals, and as a set of strategy, strategies implemented to adapt or to manage a changing sociocultural context or natural environment. That is the knowledge or understanding of the timing and the circumstances in which to recount a certain experience or to sing a particular religious service. Inherent in both of these aspects of indigenous knowledge is the importance of longitudinal transmission to the next generation and the lateral transmission to those in the community who may not have acquired certain kinds of indigenous knowledge. This idea of implementing indigenous knowledge as a strategy in managing various types of resources is based on the ethnographic findings among Siberian reindeer herders or hunters the Evenki by anthropologist Hiroki Takakura. In his observations of the Evenki's transition from reindeer herding to hunting and back again, what Takakura observed was that part of this indigenous people's vast knowledge of reindeer included two basic categories of tamed and untamed reindeer, those that would be hunted and others that would be domesticated, that is herded. 
herd it. So this relationship between herding and hunting was seen as interchangeable and placed on a continuum of indigenous knowledge. Utilized at different times and under different economic and environmental circumstances to take the greatest advantage of available subsistence resources. Inherent in the Evenki indigenous knowledge of reindeer is a flexibility and attitude towards reindeer as a cultural resource that allows the Evenki to choose between herding and hunting, depending upon the prevailing conditions affecting their subsistence lifestyle. Thus, Takakura's working definition of indigenous knowledge reads. And I quote, indigenous knowledge can be regarded as a broad array of information with a certain historical depth about regional adaptive use and management in a given environment, rather than as a definite and fixed kind of knowledge transmitted from generation to generation within a particular ethnic group. The first part of this definition highlights the aspect of indigenous knowledge not considered in much previous work, its flexibility, adaptability, its technique, its strategy. Um, this too is confirmed um, in the case of the native people of Alaska by Oscar Kawagli, um, who was a Yupik scholar, uh, who writes about the native Alaskan um, success in adapting to a changing environment. Uh, from my ethnographic findings, it is evident that indigenous knowledge is an acquired body of knowledge within which is indeed a flexibility an understanding of when and how to implement various aspects of that knowledge among the Yupik people. In considering the utility of these various aspects of indigenous knowledge, several examples of native Alaskan indigenous knowledge come to mind, namely Orthodox liturgical knowledge and Yupik language. Knowledge of the liturgical services of the Orthodox church to which more than one third of the Yupik belong has come to be acknowledged as a significant aspect of indigenous knowledge. Throughout the 20th century, the interior Orthodox villages of Alaska experienced a dearth of priests. Much teaching about the Orthodox faith was transmitted in families and villages from one generation to the next through knowledge of liturgical texts, which are theologically rich. Many Orthodox services have been conducted without priests, led by a tonsured church reader a designated lay reader or by anyone with the knowledge to prepare and order the, the liturgical texts according to the specifications of the church calendar for the liturgical day. The One Orthodox Seminary in Alaska acknowledges the need for ordained clergy and for church readers, whether tantric or lay, who can undertake the responsibility to organize liturgical services in the absence of ordained clergy so that indigenous knowledge that is um, Orthodox belief and practice is transmitted to that next generation. This Orthodox seminary was established not so much to train future theologians for posts at well-known American and international universities, but to prepare particularly native Alaskans to serve and benefit their own villages as lay ministers, catechists, religious educators, choir directors, as well as deacons and priests. Although the student body consists of both native and non-native students, the curriculum and rhythm of seminary communal life has as its goal the inspiration and religious motivation of native, mainly UPX students. The liturgical and social use of various languages by the UPX people can be seen as a strategy on how to adapt or to manage a particular cultural or natural environment. In order to expand on their body of religious knowledge, uh, UPIC Orthodox seminarians adapt to English in their classroom environment in order to interact with non yupik professors and fellow seminarians. They use church Slavonic, the original language in which their ancestors first encountered orthodoxy in certain limited liturgical contexts and yupik in interacting with some fellow seminarians with whom they might maintain uh, ties in their villages. All three languages are used liturgically in various combinations. It is evident that Yupik indigenous knowledge allows for a flexibility and interchangeability of options that are not mutually exclusive. In spite of the flexibility of language use among the Yupik, different languages occupy differing levels of significance on the continuum of indigenous knowledge. Church Slavonic, English, and Yupik are used interchangeably depending on the circumstances of the sociocultural situation. Historically, Church Slavonic and Russian, as well as Yupik, were used to transmit the doctrine of the Orthodox faith. 
It was only after the sale of Alaska to the United States in 1867 that English gradually gained ascendancy both so socially and liturgically. Language use changed also due to the loss of spiritual support that the Orthodox had from Russia following the Bolshevik Revolution there in 1917. These two historical circumstances have contributed to the current linguistic situation among the Yupik people in which many have little knowledge but a deep appreciation and nostalgia for Church Slavonic and some have lost all knowledge of their ancestral language. Many Orthodox church services now are conducted almost exclusively in English, in spite of the fact that the majority of churches in the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta region are made up of Yupik people. Recently though, the social significance of Yupik language in Anglo-Alaskan society has increased, perhaps partially because of its continued, albeit at times limited use by Yupik people. This has led to a reorientation or resignification of language along their continuum of, of indigenous knowledge with Yupik complementing and even replacing English in certain social and liturgical contexts. On the website of the Orthodox Seminary in Alaska, several video clips show women singing during a church service. In one of these clips, they are singing in English, in another in a native Alaskan language, likely Yupik or Alutik. This video was made to promote the seminary, the target audiences being native Alaskan Orthodox as well as Anglo Orthodox. Indigenous knowledge is a diachronic continuum of beliefs, knowledge about local geography and topography, ritual ethical codes, which also includes the range of strategies about when and in what context to implement particular possibilities in that body of knowledge. The notion of continuum as used by Takakura in his analysis of Siberian Evenki indigenous knowledge makes possible a range of choices for action that are inter interchangeable and even seemingly contradictory. So indigenous knowledge is a continuum through both time and over space encompassing various historical periods of a population and different types of knowledge and skills. The decision to use one language over another in a particular context is a strategy implemented to manage a particular social situation. The recent resurgence of Yupik in daily interaction alongside English has become evident. Public media is acknowledging the continued use of Yupik by a substantial number of elderly residents of the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta region, as well as an increasing number of younger people who speak Yupik as their primary language or wish to expand their comprehension and use of it. This is a marked change from governmentally enforced language policies in Alaska during much of the 20th century. It is well known that for many decades of Anglo-American socio-political domination of Alaska, children were not, only in, uh, were not only encouraged to speak English in school, but were punished for speaking any indigenous language within earshot of school and government administration. Alaskan indigenous languages became secret languages, not spoken much publicly, and their use decreased, especially among um, certain populations of uh, the, the Yupik, um, those who live more along the, um, the northern Yukon River. Um, the past several years, though, have witnessed a reversal of this situation to such a degree that the U.S. Department of Education in 2016 gave the Lower Kuskokwim School District a $1.5 million grant to enhance language proficiency for Alaskan students in English and Yupik. This school district already provides instruction at the elementary level in Yupik and Chupik. Also, a, radio, a local radio station has reported that Native children have begun to encourage the spread of Yupik literacy by participating in a Yupik Latin alphabet spelling bee. The Yupik Spelling Bee has continued since 2016 when it was first organized, but as of 2021, the idea has been taken up by Inupiaq speakers as well. The continued importance of Yupik has been recognized by the Alaska State Court System in the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta region, where in September 2016, the first official Yupik court interpreter was appointed to eight persons in the legal process. In collaboration with the new court interpreter, the Alaska court system is developing the first Yupik glossary of terms used in the US court system. KYUK, the local radio station in the Kuskokwim Delta region, offers several programs and call-in shows entirely in Yupik, 
including one program, the explicit goal of which is the transmission of indigenous knowledge by the sharing of stories and advice from the community when listeners call in. In addition to the interest and opportunity to share indigenous knowledge over the airwaves in Yupik, the station has acknowledged the large number of Yupik listeners by providing local, state, and as of September 26, 2016, national news in the Yupik language. The radio station at that time promoted itself as the only radio station in the US to offer newscasts in an indigenous language. In addition, Yupik language and indigenous knowledge have become a more significant social force, so much so that a certain segment of youth are extending its use by injecting it into the contemporary musical genre of rap. In this innovative way, they are using Yupik language in a new and non-native musical form to transmit particular aspects of the Yupik ethical code, orally, kan ruyutet, and thus to articulate a critique on contemporary society. In Orthodox Yupik villages, the languages of church services have been church Slavonic and Yupik and much later English. In the middle of the 20th century, English gradually replaced much liturgical Slavonic and Yupik, reflecting the longstanding dominance of English in Alaskan society generally. But at the beginning of the 21st century, Yupik is being used liturgically more often, especially in the lower Kuskokwim area where a greater number of native speakers reside. Tracing Orthodox liturgical knowledge and language in the diachronic continuum of indigenous knowledge for sacred and secular purposes evidences the flexibility and strategizing by the Yupiak in using their indigenous knowledge to adapt to a rapidly changing social world. The idea of a continuum of indigenous knowledge through time and space with its characteristics of flexibility, interchangeability, and contradiction is indeed a powerful analytical model in thinking about indigenous peoples, not only as adapting, but as creatively managing multiple environments in which they act. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Nina. Thank, Thank you. you. I think we have uh, time for question, Q and question, comments. If you have any comments, please unmic, um, unmute and can speak up. Any questions? I also like to acknowledge that. Um, thank you so much, Nina. That's very interesting. Thank you. So we didn't have any time for the previous presenters' questions and don't know if you have any comments or do you have any additional um, last thought you would like to add, Nina? Um, just that um, there, there is uh, just so much to learn. I, um, I, I learned so much from uh, today's um, uh, address by uh, Heather Gordon. And uh, I think indigenous knowledge is an incredibly Im important um, aspect of, of what we're trying to do. Um, so I, it, as, as someone whose research time is, is extremely limited, um, I was very glad to, um, to hear about um, various ways in which to incorporate indigenous knowledge and, and to rethink the way in which we obtain um, knowledge about indigenous uh, persons, so. Yeah, great, thank you so much. I see uh, Hannah's comment. Um, would you like to ask any questions, Hannah, to Nina? Or she was asking you your email address. Be nice if you two connect because you're studying uh, Southwest Alaska, Yupik cultures. People. Yeah, I, I hadn't um, I hadn't looked in the in the chat. Thank you so much. Well, I think it's, thank you so much again, Nina. 
Thank you. And thank you. Gonna I'll, I'll leave my to... email in the chat. Yes, thank you. That'd be great. So the next presenter is Hannah Zimmerman. And congratulations again for your award yesterday. Thank you. Great Thank you. work. Tell us a remote rural Alaskan economic indicator and ethnographic survey examining community safety and well-being in Bristol Bay, Ilgayak, Alaska. Ilgayak. Thank you. If you're ready, please share your screen and go ahead. Good. Um, all right, I'm doing that. Um, I'm coming to you guys from uh, Sápmi in northern Norway. Um, and because it's late and there's a lot of wind, the Wi-Fi is being a little weird. But those of you that live or have lived in the Arctic know that that's just a way of life up here. Um, so I just wanted to apologize in advance. Um, I, yeah, this presentation is not about the Institute for Civic Organizing, which is an organization I co-founded with friends a little over two years ago. But my brand director made some beautiful slides that I like to use whenever I can. And uh, all of the kind of research I do goes through Tico in some way, shape or form. Um, so it's a, always, it's a great community for, you know, people who are trying to solve problems and uh, thinking differently and deeply. And so uh, I always like to involve them anytime I'm curious about something. Yeah, oh, this is fun. There we go. Um, so again, thank you for the title of my paper, um, for reading it, Yoko. Um, and I am a student at Stanford and I also use the University of Alaska Fairbanks Bristol Bay campus because during the research period and writing of this paper, um, I was a community and rural development scholar at UAF BBC. Um, so it's only fair that they be recognized as a university. Um, before I go in, I just wanted to say koyana um, Thank you to the awards committee um, of the Alaska Anthropology Association for the Edwin S. Hall Jr. Paper Competition Scholarship. Um, I, uh, while a thousand dollars may not be a lot to some, uh, for me that's books, materials, resources, things I can use to keep learning, keep studying, and keep supporting myself doing work I'm really interested in. So that comes a long way. I also wanted to thank you everyone who is involved in the process of writing this paper and the projects that ensued from it. My parents are both on the call today uh, and they're joining from New York City, which is a long way from Norway and Alaska. And I just wanted to thank them because they always encouraged me to be curious um, more so than anything else. And they taught me what a blessing it is. So thank you guys. And yeah, so First off, um, I just kind of wanted to go with the definition of Bristol Bay that I'm using, um, which is sort of the economic definition, um, if you can call it that, that typically is used when you're looking at um, US Labor Department statistics and things like that to measure the economic health of the Bristol Bay region. And it's comprised of the three boroughs, the Dillingham, sorry, the Bristol Bay borough and the Lake and Peninsula borough in the Dillingham census area. So sort of those three together are sort of the region that I looked into. And before I go into this project, um, I get this question a lot, actually. Um, no offense, but why are you here? Um, because I'm from New York City. I am not ethnically in any way from the North, um, but I had kind of found my way there and stuck with it. Um, but I actually found that the work I did before the North was really helpful in tying into the work I did. And then the work I did in the North benefited the work I did sort of generally um, with the political work that I got started with. So yeah, just kind of as an intro, um, I grew up in New York City um, and I got really interested in politics at a very young age. Um, around the time I was 16, Bernie Sanders decided to run for president and I fell in love with him. I was one of those kids that you read about on the news who just loved Bernie. Um, and the Bernie campaign was kind of place where if you were a hard worker and you had ideas and could find a way to insert yourself, uh, you could do really cool stuff even if you were in high school. So sort of the last two years of my high school experience were consumed by this political work that I absolutely loved. And uh, it gave me a kind of national profile that I wasn't expecting, but that did help uh, when I applied to Stanford and luckily got in. And when I got there, um, professors, 
kind of knew who I was. So it gave me this really cool opportunity to start working with professors as a freshman and sophomore. And what we started doing was taking practical political knowledge and bringing it into the classroom. Um, so we started teaching political science courses together, me and uh, Professor Bruce Kane and Professor David Brady of the Stanford Political Science Department where we started just asking questions about, you know, how can we teach people to be practical politicians? How can we bring those skills into the classroom? So it was kind of changing the idea of what is knowledge and what can you teach? Um, that was something I was exposed to very luckily at a young age. Um, and at the same time I was doing this, I was also going into communities that I had first gone into politically and now going back in to understand the kinds of knowledges and the kinds of divides that are there. So my first ethnographic project was looking at um, this area in Northern rural Michigan, um, where my mom lives during the summer. So it was easy to find housing. And um, I was trying to understand, you know, who has access to government? Who is able to talk to administrative centers? You know, who's having their voices heard? So it was just kind of taking politics from a different angle. And the model here, uh, Concentric Circles of Government, which I published at the Rural Sociological Society, um, is something that actually inspired my later work in the North. So going back to, it's another course, um, the end of my sophomore year at Stanford, um, I got a grant to go study in Norway. And I was really excited um, because I was a Bernie girl and Bernie talked about all the time Norway, the welfare state, that's a place where you have to go. You know, you'll learn everything. And even with my personal conversations with the Senator, he always said like, you, if you wanna learn something, Hannah, go to Norway. So um, I was really lucky at the end of my sophomore year to get a grant and I went. Um, and I worked with the Norwegian labor organization, um, just kind of shadowing them in the work they were doing to protect workers in Norway. And they actually stationed me at the very top of Norway in Finnmark and Troms, uh, which is, uh, for those of you familiar with Norway, about as north as it gets. Um, it's the top of the world up here. And uh, even it was a happy accident because while I had come to study welfare, I fell in love with the north. And I knew that I wanted to do more work. Um, so yeah, this just was kind of a an article where you know people were talking about me and that was the paper I wrote from it that I had the opportunity to develop during a year-long fellowship in DC. Um, but at the same time that I was dealing with all of this uh, you know, young fame, it was really difficult for me on a personal level because I was just not emotionally mature enough to handle it. So I knew that after my sophomore year, I wanted to take some time off to really figure myself out outside of you know this identity I created for myself as a teenager at 16 that I felt was still following me around. So I took a gap year that year and I started looking for ways to get involved in the North. So this is how I first encountered Dillingham. I saw an email from the Rural Sociological Society that the Polaris Project from Penn State University was looking for research assistants and people who could volunteer. So I sent the PIs an email and asked if there was any way I could volunteer and help. And they said, sure. Um, I am no longer involved with the project, but that's the website and you should check them out because they're doing really cool stuff. And um, uh, they said that they were going on a scoping trip to Dilling, this place called Dillingham that I had never heard of. I'd never been to Alaska. So I said, yes, I would love to come. And uh, the PI said, well, if you pay for your own plane flight, um, you can uh, come with us. So uh, I was, I think I used up everything in my meager savings account and, um, just came on the trip and took notes and posted on Twitter and tried to be helpful in every way I could. Um, but what happened was I fell in love with Dillingham and knew I wanted to come back. Um, so yeah, this is just Tico, which was what I was working on during that same period. And this was an organization that was based on, again, the knowledge that I discussed that we we're bringing into the classroom, but again, standardizing it. And what we were focusing on, me and the people who founded it, was the different kinds of knowledge that one can use to sort of decrease the boundaries that exist between people and public institutions. So we were really focusing on finding ways to combine and harvest that knowledge and then make it available to people as a way of breaking down the boundaries that exist that I found when doing research in rural Michigan. Uh, anyway, so when the pandemic happened, we started doing more with you know, how you can stay civically and politically engaged during a pandemic. 
And the other thing that happened during the pandemic was I was done with my gap year and you know ready to go back to school, but school wasn't ready for me. So I um, remembered thinking, okay, I can learn from wherever, where do you wanna go? And many of you I'm sure who are Alaska transplants know the siren song that Alaska has over people. So I had the email still from the mayor of Dillingham, Alaska, which is the capital of the Dillingham census area. And I sent her an email asking if she needed any help. Um, because, you know, I wasn't allowed to go to school, I wasn't allowed to go to California, and I had time and I wanted to help. And so uh, she said, yeah, actually, um, sure, we have an apartment, why don't you, you know, if uh, just get your plane flight, and I'm sure we'll figure something out for you to do. So I showed up in Dillingham uh, in January of 2021, with uh, two duffel bags and a poodle. Uh, so that was Matt's Hunter. He was my ninth birthday present. And he's actually with me in Arctic Norway. This experience is a precursor for January, 2022, um, where I showed up in Arctic Norway with one duffel bag, the poodle and a mattress. So those of you that have lived remotely know the struggle. And while I was living in Dillingham, I was just trying to learn and observe as much as I could. Um, since the North was already a place that was special for me and I was just trying to understand everything I could about just what the community was. Um, so here are some pictures from the food, from the sites, from books I was reading that were published by locals. And it was really cool. Um, and at the same time, I was working remotely. And this is the great thing about modern technology with the Tico team um, of people I'd been working with since 2020, sort of on this idea of knowledge and public institutions. And I was trying to combine the work I was doing in Alaska with this work for Tico. Um, and so I started to ask some questions based on what I was observing in Alaska that were aligned with what Tico was doing. And the questions were, what are the current institutional and governmental frameworks or indicators we use to measure community vitality in Bristol Bay? Are they working? Do they accurately portray the economic and community health of the Bristol Bay region so that public institutions so that public institutions and government can provide proper welfare services. And then if these frameworks and indicators are not working, how can we make our own? So that was kind of what I wanted to explore. So the next thing we did was uh, apply for grants. And we were lucky that there are some people who are really interested in that kind of work too. So I just wanted to thank everyone who kind of helped us get going and you know, gave us money to do this exploration, us being Tico. And uh, yeah, we also had some lovely people who supported us, allowed us to give presentations, and that was wonderful. But when it first came to digging into this question of, you know, is there, is there enough information that can help sort of public institutions and government assess what is really going on, um, we started with the statistics that were out there. And sure, there were some statistics about remote rural Alaska, um, but they were only telling a part of the story. Um, here you have statistics about um, industries, about population, um, about yeah, employment. And then I was trying to understand how cash was getting into the region. And I couldn't find anything that was just kind of a compilation. And this is something I actually published in my paper. But this is just, I started compiling myself grants I could find online and what they were being used for. Uh, so this is a graphic I made when I was just trying to understand what's going on. And then I wanted to understand, you know, how are people interacting with each other? Um, because there was not a lot of information about that. So um, if you can see here, this is a chart from Scott Goldsmith who wrote kind of like the paper on remote rural Alaska. And he talks here about the informal economy. Uh, and he said, residents exchange goods and services, no data to estimate value. Um, so that was, you know, one thing for me where I was like, great. I'm trying to understand you know, how this community works and there's no data. Um, so a lot of what I discussed in my paper and I'm just sort of giving a uh, shout out now was the importance of Facebook and the Facebook marketplace serving as a literal marketplace for transaction. In fact, the earrings I'm wearing right now came from the Facebook marketplace. Um, just sort of how that was working as an informal economic uh, operator. And then going to the next thing, there were words people were using to describe the sharing economy that you don't have in the English or economic lexicon. And I don't have time to go into this, 
but they were just another thing to consider when you're thinking about how can you talk about the economy, you know, if these words don't exist in our vocabulary. Um, so we together, um, so my work, and this is sort of separating Tico, was when I wrote this paper, is I just started putting together all of the findings that I found that could describe the economy. And I knew that these were sort of the basis for what could become an indicator. And uh, these are sort of some findings. And um, you have like, when do people work? And the Bristol Bay Native Corporation coordinates with its 31 village corporation to ensure it's over 10,000 regional shareholders get sufficient fish leave from work. And you know, how does the subsistence economy work practically? And uh, you, it, you can see that in understanding that you have to understand that Yupik Eskimo, Aleut, and Athabascan communities in the region have been practicing subsistence for 4,000 years. So they're older than, you know, modern economics. <laughs> and um, understanding how those transactions work is um, understanding a lot of, you know, what is the makeup of the region. Uh, so that was just something we noticed was trying to describe those interactions. And then the next thing, and this is sort of going back to, this is like, what came next was what is that indicator? And this is not something that's covered in the paper, but this is sort of something that is like the next steps going forward. And this is something we'd been developing since we started Tico, which was the idea that, you know, in order to have an effective relationship between people and public institutions, there needs to be kind of this cycle where people are able to learn in the community, they're able to organize um, specifically to create effective social action from the institutions so that services can be created and maintained for what people need. Um, and so that was kind of what we saw coming out of this was, you know, we just studied this community um, and we can see that our model is something that could be really used here because, you know, what if you could make your own data now uh, instead of being reliant on the US Labor Department or these statistics that aren't really capturing what's going on. So the next thing we did was we took all this information we learned and compiled from Bristol Bay and presented in different places. And we went to another community. Uh, and this is Waddington, New York. Um, so those of you who aren't as familiar with the lower 48, uh, you can see that's New York State where the little cross is, is where I was with two members of my team last summer. Um, yeah, I was connected to someone named Alex Hammond uh, right here in the pink box. I was, uh, while I was living in Alaska, I was invited to teach a course at Harvard, uh, sorry, guest lecture in a course at Harvard on student political identity development. Um, and while I was teaching the course, I got to meet a lot of young people who were doing really cool mover and shakers thing. One of them was a kid named Alex Hammond, who was 25 and the town supervisor of his town in upstate New York. So we connected and he loved Tico and he invited us to come, which is ultimately why we came <laughs> up. I, he was surprised that we actually came um, to sort of take a lot of this listening, observing, measuring skills we had developed in Bristol Bay um, and take him to another place. Um, so yeah, I actually um, gave the lecture in my friend's living room in Dillingham, Alaska, and I got him a plaque from Harvard that says, this is a lecture hall at Harvard, um, which I think is great <laughs> that it's still up there. So that's my real contribution to Dillingham. And uh, this is just some pictures from Waddington. Uh, that was I, two of the TICO staff members volunteer staff members got funding from their universities to work with us full time over the summer. Um, so here are just some pictures from what we learned in Waddington, um, the writing we were doing, the analysis we were doing, where we were going back to sort of the same thing we were doing in Bristol Bay, where we were trying to understand everything that was important to the community. So we can really, you know, start to figure out what is this indicator? What can we measure? How can we measure it? How can we make it useful? What do people want? And um, that was really important. This is just one of my favorite pictures. It's the town of Waddington. Me and uh, Elizabeth and Nora um, are wearing our Tico sweatshirts um, and we're standing with Alex Hammond, the 25 year old town supervisor. And when we came back from Waddington, uh, Alex sent us text because it turns out what we were doing was actually gaining publicity in the local news. Um, you could, people were really excited about what we were doing. It was the same way in Bristol Bay, people really wanted it. So we were starting to think, oh my gosh, this is something people want. This is something we can continue to develop. Um, so what does that mean for us next? 
Well, coming back from Waddington, uh, we started to just work in notebooks and sort of on what you see on the right was what we came up with. And this is basically my disgusting four-year-old notebook with three people's handwriting in it. And we had created the indicator we wanted, which we called the US Individual Rights and Freedoms Assessment, where we were going in and trying to understand like from the Declaration of Independence, which was promising the right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, how are we doing on that? Um, and we're, you know, looking at it as a public good, as something that could support people, support, you know, people who were frustrated with their governments and governments who wanted to do more. And this was a document we wrote, the 2022 Civic Development Report, um, which was the original name for it, um, 2022, ambitious. Uh, so that date, you can change that to probably 2023 or 2024, um, assuming when we get the partners and funding that we need to keep this going. But uh, that was sort of everything that came together in the coming months once I left Alaska. And uh, what that meant next after I left New York was I started traveling and meeting with more members of communities and telling them about what we were doing. And slowly we started to build up this network, as you can see by places on the map, um, of people who wanted to be a part of it, of people who thought what we were doing was important and people who wanted this indicator. Um, and of course, you can see number seven is Dillingham, which is where everything started. And uh, it all just goes back to this cycle we were creating, which was, you know, the indicator we were working with. Um, and that was something that we're really excited. So this next step is, you know, we want sort of proof that, you know, we can maneuver and create and work with this indicator. And it's something that will help American communities. So ultimately what um, Dillingham became was the uh, basis for understanding Dillingham, not just as an, a part of Alaska, not just as a part of the North, but Dillingham as a community in America. And you know, how can you meet those needs? So thank you for listening to me. And here are some social media handles if you wanna follow what we're doing at Tico. Uh, thank you guys so much for having me and thank you again for the award. Um, it really means a lot. Thank you, Hannah. Um, so we are now on a break. We will be uh, meet, meeting back here in Zoom room B at uh, 1220. So um, we'll leave the chat and the room open. So if you have questions for Hannah or some of the other presenters, um, please feel free. So thanks. But otherwise, uh, Stacy, you'll be on at twelve twenty. Thanks. So these are just some of the design complications involved uh, with housing in remote Alaskan locations. Extreme climate is definitely uh, one of the major complications. Uh, designing buildings that work and last in extreme climate, getting wet from all sides. And now of course, climate change, which is eroding the ground out from underneath many houses. So the permafrost thaw and subsidence and foundations that are failing and houses that are very difficult to move um, and increased snow, rain and insects. And then many communities grappling with decisions over whether to relocate or manage, retreat, or protect in place. Uh, really, remote logistics is one of the main complications. As many people who've worked in Alaska know, getting people and materials out to remote Alaska is extremely expensive and it's extremely limited. Uh, our transportation infrastructure is, is not really up to snuff for what's needed. And then in a lot of communities, there's not the local, uh, there's not a lot of heavy equipment there's not a lot of building materials there. Some places don't have gravel if they want to build pads. But at the same time, uh, people want jobs building homes in those communities. Of course, the high costs of imported goods and imported labor. There's a lot of complications with land ownership, very complicated bureaucracy, getting land if you want to build a house. And then there's a lot of problem with financing homes and a lot of issues with people who are unbanked in the first place or financial literacy. And all of these things contribute to a pretty dramatic housing crisis in Alaska, which has been exacerbated by the pandemic um, quite a bit. 
as you can imagine, supply costs have gone up, um, restrictions on travel and need to isolate really complicated, these already complicated uh, building logistics. So I just wanted to give a little overview of this housing crisis. Uh, this is based on 2018 numbers from the Alaska Housing Finance Corporation's um, housing assessment. So these are kind of old numbers, but the estimate then was that Alaska would need over 39,000 new homes by 2025, but then also there's almost 15,000 homes that are what we call one-star units, so really not fit for human habitation that need to be replaced. So that's a total of 55,000 new homes. So we're kind of rounding up, but also not accounting for here homes that are aging out. This is just the homes that we need, not accounting for the homes that we will need because they're too old. It's also not accounting for the over 4,000 beds that will be needed for elder care um, to maintain current elder care levels. So I wanted to show just a few different ways of looking at this. If there are three people in the average Alaskan household and we need 55,000 new homes, you could look at it that 22% of the current population of Alaska is in need of housing. That's over 161,000 people. And then lo looking about like, how long does it actually take to build a home in Alaska? These are also conservative numbers. If you have a six person crew, um, maybe working 60 hours a week for eight weeks. So that's almost 3000 hours per home to build a home. And we should mention that uh, the costs of a home are not just in construction, up to 12% of the costs of a house can be in the design of the house or 15% for the construction management. And one estimate is also that 40% of the cost is in transporting the materials. So housing in re remote Alaskan locations is very expensive. Just another way to look at this, how much construction time would it take to build enough houses? You're building them one at a time, it would be over 18,000 years. And here, if you had crews, six person crews building three homes a year, um, you would need 11,000 builders to be building homes over the course of 10 years. One other thing to think about is just uh, again, back to the transportation. So we estimate that the average pretty small house, like a 1,000 to 1,200 uh, 1, square foot house. It's about 30,000 pounds of material. So multiply that by the 55,000 homes that we need, that's about 375,000 tons of material that need to be shipped or gotten to Alaskan locations. So just talking a little bit about prefabricated housing. There is a lot of hype around prefabricated housing. And um, there's a lot of um, experiences, negative experiences with all kinds of housing in Alaska, including prefabricated housing. But the, the people who are boomers, the pr promoters of prefabricated housing, they believe and are promoting that the COVID-19 pandemic is going to accelerate this under the shift that's underway to prefabrication and it will transform the building industry in five to 10 years. They also say that prefabrication represents the democratization of housing, making it accessible to all. And there are definitely people here at, at working at CCHRC who believe that prefab is the only way to address the housing crisis. So just to position myself, I probably am susceptible to some of that hype given what I've learned over the past few years working there. And this is a really text heavy uh, slide. I just wanna show that the reality of prefab for remote Alaskan communities, there are still a lot of problems. You can imagine that if you ship in uh, an entire house, like a pre-built house, that limits the number of jobs you can get in the community building homes. Um, you can't really customize that house. It's hard to transport them. And if it's a community that gets it by barge, that's one or two times a year. They require heavy equipment. 
the foundations are not adequate. There's a really risky type of financing needed for manufactured homes. It's hard to inspect them. They're not designed usually for extreme climates or the way of life for subsistence processing, Arctic entry ways. Definitely not designed for the number of occupants that usually end up in Alaskan housing, houses. Um, and they depreciate. So not a great solution here looking at, does this solve the uh, housing crisis? Does it really solve the remote logistics? They might be more affordable, not built for the climate, not really designed to deal with climate change or relocation, uh, have financing problems and doesn't address the local jobs. So a little bit about a different type of prefabricated modular housing that we think could be more, uh, has more potential. It's definitely a, one part of the confusion in this study has been, there's a lot of misunderstanding of all the terms. So when I'm talking about system built kit of parts, it means that it's, uh, you could think of it as Legos or like build it yourself furniture, like there comes in little pieces and you assemble it on site. One thing that does is it's much more flexible to transport. You can flat pack and ship that on a barge or even on a plane. Any part, you know, two people could lift any part. So there would be housing jobs assembling these kinds of houses, but you don't need really uh, highly specialized labor or tools. There's no cutting on site. So there's a real reduction in waste, um, faster construction, fewer delays, easier to finance and inspect and customizable. So several advantages there, but now, sorry again for the text heavy slide. Then we would like to think about uh, all the advantages of that type of offsite prefab system built kit homes. And what would it be like if you could build that type of home out of locally available materials? And really what we're talking about here is timber in locations that have timber resources. So in that case, remote communities could manufacture and build their own housing from their own resources, so housing sovereignty, uh, because it would really strengthen the local economy and increase self-sufficiency and agency. People could log, they could mill, they could transport, and they could build all their own homes, and all the costs of production would be spent in the community. It's a lot less expensive. Log homes are very popular. Possibly strategic lodging to create fire breaks, and wood homes are fire resistant, and there's a reduced danger of mold and mildew, which anybody who knows anything about housing in Alaska knows that indoor air quality, mold and mildew are uh, actually enormous problem and human health issue. And also wood is the most carbon sequestering building material. It has the lowest environmental impact. And they have a, low, a longer life expectancy. And in many cases, they can be disassembled and moved without heavy equipment. And so just looking at all of these design considerations, how could community-led self-assembled system-built homes from local natural resources address them? And I'm not so um, persuaded by the hype that it would uh, magically solve all these problems, but from all the research that we have conducted, does seem like it has the best chance of meeting some of these uh, um, challenges, climate change especially. So um, at CCHRC, we really try to think now about only designing homes that can be built uh, to be moved easily um, and are built for the local climate and are easy to finance and don't require heavy equipment in local, in communities. So that's a very short presentation, but I, I hope uh, it raises some questions and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Stacy. Thank you for the presentation. I was almost going to send you a message, uh, five minutes, but <laughs> we have five minutes for question and comment. If anybody have a comment, and unmute. Yeah. 
Well, great. If there aren't any questions, I really appreciate anybody's attention to this. I'll put my email in the chat if anybody has questions. And um, thanks so much. I've really enjoyed everybody else's presentations. Thank you so much. Oh, I think we have five minutes, but if our next presenter, she's ready, if you are ready. Melina? Yes, I'm ready. Okay. Yes, so the next presenter is Melina Achiniga, Every Speck of Water. And if you're ready, go ahead and share the screen. All right, let me go ahead and get on that now. Thank you. There we go. Can we see that? Is that good? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So, um, uh, hi. Oh, can you still hear me? Yep, that looks good. Thank you. Okay, so hi, my name is Melina Arsenega, and today I'm going to be presenting an examination of what is colloquially referred to as dry cabin living, um, that is to occupy a residence without the feature of indoor plumbing. It's familiar to a lot of us Alaskans. I'm going to be studying this looking for some themes of cultural resilience, conservation, and how this lifestyle affords many economic relief um, and sort of access to a very niche community uh, enabled by public infrastructure. So I'm going to break up my presentation into three sections. The first is going to be some general info regarding the area of focus, the Fairbanks North Star Borough. And then I'm going to present some survey results of which I had 45 inquiries made, but only received 33 total responses. And then finally, I'm going to cover some analysis, um, sort of a jaw, general and broad analysis of the responses and identify um, a conclusion of economic and cultural analysis, as well as identify some further areas of interest. So to start, we first look into some basic economic info. The Census Bureau median annual income in 2019 for the Fairbanks North Star Borough was about $62,602 per resident. Compared to the United States um, average annual income, it seems quite high, but as us Alaskans know, living in Alaska is still very costly. And according to a study by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the hourly rate for a living wage for one individual without any dependents to support themselves is well over that minimum wage. And um, it's $14.79, which comes out to about $30,000 of an annual income. And this amount only increases depending on how many children you have and whether or not there are one or multiple individuals working to support a household. And so basically, in every circumstance, someone must make above minimum wage in order to accommodate these living wage thresholds. And so then we can look at how much of that specifically goes into rent. And so using some comparative information, we can kind of see that the estimates for rent for one individual, even for the smallest building household, is around $1,000, um, varying a little bit below and a little bit above, and also varying depending on what utilities are going to be included. And so you can also see there in that bottom left, a little snapshot of uh, Craigslist to see some prices for dry cabins and how they drastically differ from those annual or from those monthly rental estimates. And so if you kind of think about this briefly back to that individual making the $14.79 an hour, that's about $2,500 a month um, based on a 40 hour work week. And so including that average rent around $1,000, that would leave an individual with only $1,500 to cover utilities, food, general bills, insurances, things such as that. And so my purpose in sort of talking about this is to introduce some economic pressures that Fairbanks residents face. Um, they can be analyzed alongside various public infrastructures, such as in particular, the one of focus here, which is our local water resource. So in Fairbanks, our local water source comes from the Canada Basin Aquifer. And I'm not really very specialized to comment in this field. However, what I gathered is that the aquifer is rather large. And as you can see in that map there from the United States Geological Survey, and that it is essentially because of elevation differences that ground flow really allows for wells along the Chena River area to pull water from the aquifer. And all of this water being pulled requires a very specific amount of governance and regulation in terms of quality. For us, that takes place on a federal, state, and local level. So on the federal level, you have the United States Code and the Environmental Protection Agency. They establish and enforce these various regulations regarding water quality. 
And then in Alaska, we have Alaska Administrative Code and our Alaska Constitution that establish that quality as well. But in terms of regulating and controlling public water systems, that falls to the Department of Environmental Conservation. And they sort of enforce that public water systems abide by these federal and state level regulations in terms of water um, quantity or quality. And if we look further into these entities throughout the state that manage water treatment and distribution, we can see that there are quite a number of them. According to the Department of, Envi or of Environmental Conservation, there are over 44 water treatment and service operators in the Fairbanks area alone. Um, moving forward, I'm gonna choose to focus on two very large providers and that's going to be Golden Heart Utilities and College Utilities Corporation. They are both sort of complementary to each other where College Utilities occupies mostly the Western half of the borough and then Golden Heart Utilities is more of that Eastern half. And I really can't say what I know the differences in detail between these two. I do know that one worker did comment to me that the primary difference they see is that one is union, whereas one is non-union. And in general, they're both owned by the same company called Fairbanks Water and Sewer, which is in turn owned by Corix, a Canadian company. And they are in turn or owned by the British Columbia Investment and Management Corporation, aka BCI. And so GHU's website says that they pull their water from four wells along the Chena River and that their plant operators must be DEC certified. So we can kind of see all these relevant aspects coming together in terms of where the water is coming from, who is regulating the quality, and how it's being distributed throughout the community. But how does that factor into those that live in a dry cabin, those that must go get their water? And that's going to be those water fill stations, of which very commonly known as water wagon which is privately owned by a local family and they purchase their water from college utilities. Then we have the watering hole, AKA 24 hour, also privately owned. They get their water depending on the location and specific that you're looking at. And then you also have BNC Laundromat also privately owned and they're located in the CUC service area. And then you have the unique Fox Spring, which is owned by the Friends of Fox Spring, a nonprofit foundation and the Alaska Department of Transportation and Public Facilities is who maintains, operates, and regulates that. Um, the Fox Spring is a natural spring modified into a well. It comes at no charge. As you can see there on the bottom left, I've incorporated some various water costs for these fill stations. These costs were obtained in the fall of uh, last year. And so they vary very much depending on which fill station you go to and which location even. And so, now on to the exciting part, the survey questions. We now have this premise put into place that there is this offer of economic alternatives. And that is you have the option of having a household without the feature of indoor plumbing, but it is affordable. And there are these accessible fill stations and other infrastructure that make it possible to accommodate the need to get and haul water. And so in attempting to capture the dry cabin residents' economic perspectives of this lifestyle, I took a 10 question survey from each individual who reached out to me in order to get the survey questions out there and to get contact with participants. I went ahead and utilized Facebook through a couple of posts on some dry cabin groups. And I also posted flyers throughout various areas of town. Every participant participated anonymously. If they did provide me with public information, I removed it when I was combining all of the information collected. And you'll kind of notice too, going along from here on out, there's gonna be pictures that don't have references. Those are specifically because they were either provided by those participants for the survey or by myself. So to retain their anonymity, I omitted them for the references. And um, I am like thinking about how the automatic first bias comes into place as in those who participate in the survey are very limited because they had to have either had social media access specific to one social media site. They would have had to have internet in some sort of variety and they would have had to have an email if they even reached out to me by those flyers. And even the location of the flyers posted did create its own bias as well where they were primarily in Central Fairbanks in and around campus area. And I think that if I were to continue this project, I would need to expand upon how I established contact, the formats of which I was communicating with those participants, as well as I would have really liked to have included a historical examination of cabin living in the area. 
Um, also note too, as you read through these questions, question number five was more so out of my personal curiosity. It is going to be omitted from the further presentation. And you can also notice that those questions are very vague. Um, I wanted to give individuals the freedom to structure their own responses and emphasize what they wanted to emphasize. And this resulted in a lot of variety in the responses that I got. Some people wrote very large paragraphs. Some people gave me a couple sentences or even just a few words for their responses. And so as we go along, we're going to see this sort of structure here on the slides where I'm gonna have verbatim quotes and then I'm also gonna have some summarized info for the sake of time. I'm not gonna read those verbatim quotes, but I do invite you to read them because they're very interesting and these are only a couple of snippets of them. And so in regard to where these residents get their water, a majority of them cited the multiple fill stations around town. A lot of them cited the water wagon, um, a handful cited Fox Spring because specifically it was free and because they said it was the best tasting water. Um, some of them did get their water from a faucet at work or their various friends and family's houses. Out of all 33 participants, I only had one person who relied solely on rain and snow and the rest supplemented those natural sources alongside the water fill station as a source. So overall, there's this attitude of convenience of location, cost, as well as even the taste or the quality of the water that people are looking for when they're picking out where to retrieve the water from. In regard to where the water came from, most responses said they didn't even think about it or they weren't sure. Some did correctly guess that it was city water. And the people who did use Fox Spring knew that it was a, that it was a freshwater spring. In terms of transporting this water, almost everyone used plastic water jugs. The exception was one individual who used plastic buckets with lids. For the most part, these lids and containers or these containers and jugs were purchased from local stores in the area. Sometimes they were found at transfer sites or at garage sales, or sometimes they were even inherited when the individual moved into the residency, that is the dry cabin. And before I go on to the next slide, um, there's a, statistics, a statistic I want you to keep in mind from the Environmental Protection Agency based on the US Geological Survey um, that concluded that each American uses an average of 82 gallons of water a day in their home. And with that, we can look at comparatively at the average water usage of these dry cabin residents. Uh, for the most part, a lot of people gave me specific numbers. I divided up those responses based on whether or not they were given in the format of daily, weekly, or monthly usage. Two individuals claimed not to track their use. Three said that it varied too much seasonally for them to give me an accurate amount, um, with a trend of there being more water usage in the summer and less throughout the winter. If you even look at these use responses, you can see that those amounts aren't really anywhere near that 82 gallon a day estimate. And in general, it's because of the nature that the water has to be transported. It must be hand carried. And then, so there's this very big theme and importance put into conservation and minimal use. You can also know too, that a lot of this water usage varies based on um, the circumstances surrounding the person living in the cabin, such as whether or not they have children, whether or not there are multiple people there, if they have livestock, pets, if they're showering or doing laundry inside of their residency, or even if they're gardening, the list goes on, it's still a drastic difference from that 82 gallon a day estimate. And then in terms of exposing the water, there was a lot of good attitudes about being cautious about what is being dumped outside because that was the main response for how the water was handled. A lot of people said they avoided chemicals and certain foods when they dumped it and that they were careful not to dump it around the structures such as their cabin or in their walkways or driveways. Um, and so it, it's just kind of interesting to see the different ways that people even consider how they not only have to carry the water in, but how they also have to essentially bring out every single drop as well. And so onto those two big tasks, um, the laundry and showering aspect of living in a dry cabin. A lot of people do craft their own mechanisms in order to get this uh, portion done, which is as seen over here on the right side of the screen where you see a hula hoop suspending with a shower curtain and there's likely a tub underneath it. And some people also have uh, RV washing machines, things such as that, that they've repurposed in order to do their laundry at home. For the most part, a lot of responses indicated that they used public faculties though. Um, some people though would barter products and services and goods in order to use friends and families, showers and do laundry. 
And so it was interesting to see too that there was a lot going into being decided when they were looking at where they were going and how they were going about committing to doing laundry and showering. And so for the next question, my favorite question from the survey is the response of what individuals do for a living. And me personally, when I encountered the aspects of dry cabin living, I immediately thought it was strictly for students um, or that it was very temporary for people. And as the years have gone by, my perspective has changed. And this question even sort of emphasized that more where I got to see this very um, broad spectrum of people uh, living in dry cabins, everything from project managers to scientists, to business owners, to artists, to therapists, to parents. Uh, it's just, it varied so much and it was very interesting to read. And then outside of the two students, um, not a single person gave me an identical response for their profession out of the 33 individuals. Uh, even those two education professionals worked at vastly different levels of academics. And so after this, they also commented on the cost of rent. In terms of eight individuals who own their cabin, I didn't incorporate the amount they pay for their mortgage here. I strictly kept it to the amount of rent paid by each individual. Um, one person did not pay rent because it was their occupancy was in exchange for work. Most did provide a specific number though, of which I used to calculate a sample median of $575 a month. And again, this varies based on what utilities are being included. And if you recall though, at the beginning of this presentation, the median rental cost closer to $1,000 per month is um, really kind of a revealing point as to why these individuals are choosing to occupy these residencies. And additionally, some responses even included why they also chose to occupy these spaces, whether it was access to trails or uh, the fact that it was away from urban centers and sort of private, and then they could have pets which brings us to our general impressions that we found amongst the survey participants. There was this initial theme of perceived difficulty and even weirdness um, in a lot of responses that eventually became this impression of being normal, simple, freeing, and while for others on the opposite side of that spectrum, they found it tiring and not at all desirable. Um, some participants said that they felt mixed impressions, not entirely positive, not entirely negative, and then this is an important observation at the bottom there, if you look at that uh, verbatim quote, that it requires a lot of reliance on city and private services. Um, this, again, is sort of referencing that availability to, of the infrastructure to these residents that enables this lifestyle. And overall, these sort of impressions exhibit how um, understandings can shift regarding cultural placement for these individuals. The feelings that they have about the lifestyle from the outside very much differs from once they have experienced firsthand, albeit it can go in either way, whether or not they very much dislike it or very much like it. And so now onto the question of why would they live in a dry cabin? Is it preference or is it publication? Out of this, um, I can say that here again, I was very vague with asking this question because I wanted people to identify the details of their preference or the ways in which they felt obligated. 11 individuals cited economic necessity that obliged them to live in a dry cabin, of which six said that they hoped that it was temporary for them. Seven responses said they preferred to choose to live at this lifestyle. However, two of them didn't know if they saw it as long-term or as a permanent arrangement. Um, five individuals gave me very mixed responses. Uh, one person showed extreme disdain for it. Two mentioned that they were raised this way and therefore used to the lifestyle. And one said that they were obligated because they couldn't find any housing to accommodate their pets. And two people gave me a sort of, not a one-sided answer, but they mentioned that they liked that it simplified their life. And lastly, most of the cabin owners mentioned that they were going to pursue modifications to include running water configurations to their cabins. And if we incorporate the previously mentioned general impressions, we can kind of see how all of this really ties together. Being financially obliged to the lifestyle sometimes causes individuals to not see it as a long-term arrangement or to hold a standard of disliking it, contrasted to those who came to enjoy it because it offered financial freedom and it offered different, a different quality of living. And so I think if I had to really summarize the attitude here in these responses, I'd say that there was a very strong tone of acceptance with a, a hint of optimism, sort of a silver lining of making the best of things. And yet this lifestyle definitely comes with some obvious challenges. And so in regard to the responses of those major challenges faced, 
not a single person only listed one, everybody listed a quite a few, I would say. The highlights do uh, include that it was very time consuming, that the water chores were, the so-called water chores were also very demanding for various reasons, either time consuming or they hated having to refill their water. A few mentioned children and personal hygiene as being challenges to accommodate with this lifestyle. And interestingly enough, two specific, specific individuals said that outhouse trips at 40 below was their major complaint. And so overall, we see these challenges, primarily that of time consumption and physical efforts that go into this lifestyle as being metaphorical costs to this more inexpensive alternative uh, to having a residency in the borough. And so the lifestyle of not having running water is not uncommon throughout the world and throughout history, but it is something that's not familiar to a lot of Americans. And it is certainly unique to Fairbanks where we have this public infrastructure that has paralleled and even complemented this lifestyle. And so a reminder, 33 individuals participated, only one uh, acquired all of their water from non-city provided sources. And so really, if it weren't for these systems, it's curious to think of if this lifestyle would even be as popular as it is um, because of how difficult it might be to manage. And this also goes alongside with public showers and laundry being available. There is this variety offered to individuals to uh, pick from in order to accommodate their water related needs. And it's also in a way sort of a deterrent um, for overuse of these common water consuming activities, whereas someone at home who has their own shower might opt to take an hour long shower if they buy a cabin resident who chooses to go to say PNC laundry mat has a time shower that they're paying for. So overall, there are all of these factors being considered here regarding economic choices and limitations and these desired standards of living, um, not to mention the undeniable feature that a lot of people pursue of having this financial freedom in the current market. And we're also thinking about uh, at this point where climate change really threatens resource availability. I think that dry cabin culture is sort of an example of resiliency and creativity regarding economic and conservation roles. And it really has sort of achieved this um, level of economic and environmental homeostasis involving local resource availability, financial and personal desires, um, various processes for pressures and allowances uh, adapting alongside one another. And so we really have this culture of resilience in dry cabin residences, residents where an economic avenue presents this very strict struggle and it's counteracted with this tenacious ability to thrive in an ever-changing locality. And um, so that was my presentation. Thank you. Guess I can take questions if there are any. Oh, thank you for the applause emojis. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, um, Melina. That was really cool. As a as a dry cabin liver um, myself, it it yeah it it made me think about some things. So awesome! It was a cool presentation. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I've also been living in a dry cabin for about six years myself, so it was very fun to engage in other um, these chats with these other dry cabin dwellers and kind of get a little bit more into the culture and see how it really creates the sense of community here. So it was really it was really fun. Yeah. Cool. Nice. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I just want to say thank you, um, Yoko and I. Thank you all for being here and for all of your presentations. Um, if you um, are interested, beginning at 2 o'clock in this room, we will have the Beringia Shared Heritage Session, um, and that will go from 2 to 5 um, in Zoom Room B, this room. Um, and we can hang out if there are any additional questions for all of the, the earlier presentations. Otherwise, um, thank you for attending and thank you all to um, such wonderful presentations. So thank you.